I'm not looking at the chat, so if you want to if you want to add something, then you should unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Okay, you don't have to raise your hand first. You can just go ahead and do it. <clears throat> okay, ladies, we spoke about the uh, the mitzvah of Sipur. That was last week. For those who are still here, those of you who weren't, I sent it out as an audio. So if you haven't heard that, I think it's very important. You don't listen to the second one, you don't have to, but that first one is very important just to get a uh, sort of a framework for understanding our approach to Pesach Bechlal and puts everything else that you're learning from other teachers into an important context. It's actually, when you think about it, the fact that there's a mitzvah of Sipur is unusual. Usually when we're talking about the mitzvahs of the Chagim, they're mitzvahs, some kind of an action that we have to do. Usually something that's not instantly recognizable what it means, like the shofar or your lulav. We spend all of our time sort of trying to figure out you know, what is it that it means? What are we trying to achieve by doing this? In the mitzvah of Sipur, it's actually a mitzvah of understanding, really, uh, I think, unique among the, uh, at least the mitzvahs of the Chagim, right? But when we spoke about it, we spoke about the fact that the, we, we base ourselves on the Rambam, that the focus, really, what are we really, what is Pesach all about? We're supposed to be focusing on the, on the Nisim. The reason for that is, according to the Ramban, is because it's through those Nisim that we get our Amuna. And through the Rambam, it's that through those Nisim, we really come to uh, accept and enter into that special relationship that the Jewish people have with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. But another word for that is Malchus. Yeah. But we do also have mitzvahs. We have mitzvahs, Maishas. We also have mitzvahs that we do. Interestingly enough, all of them, one of the reasons why Pesach is so dear to my heart is all the mitzvahs have to do with eating. Actually, a little bit unusual. In fact, it's also unique. Longer discussion, not for now. Spoke about that in the other shir that I sent out to you as an audio file. Anyway, the Korban Pesach really is the natural focus and center of the Chag in the sense that, uh, that the Korban Pesach is really makes a reality out of what we're talking about in the Sibur. If the Sibur is recognizing HaKadosh Baruch Hu and accepting this relationship that we have with him of Malchus, the Korban Pesach makes that a reality because the whole point is the Korban Pesach is that first act of avodah, it's the first act of service that we do to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and really to bring that Korban Pesach, we inaugurated, in, in Mitzrayim, we inaugurated that relationship uh, with the Kaddish Baruch Hu as our Melech. And when we used to have a, a Beis HaMikdash, then every time, when we, every year when we brought that Korban Pesach, we'd be, basically be rededicating ourselves to that relationship. This was spoken about very beautifully by Mrs. Levy, I guess it was last night or two nights ago? Two nights ago already. So if you didn't hear that, the recordings, if they're not up already, they'll be up pretty soon. Um, we're still straightening that out, but it certainly should be up either by the end of this week or the beginning of next week. But the, uh, the, 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 the Korban Pesach, though, even though in a certain sense the Korban Pesach really ought to be, is naturally the center of the holiday. It's a little bit hidden for us. I mean, that could change. We still have two weeks left. But as at least um, in, for, the, for, for the last several thousand years, um, that uh, the, a thousand something, uh, that Korban Pesach, as important as it is, is actually now a hidden part of the Seder. We have some ze- zecher to it, but uh, but not really the focus so much. We also have Marar. Marar is another important eating mitzvah, another assay, which we do. The purpose of that on the basic level is by eating that more, we want to remind ourselves of the pain of the exile. Exactly why we do that is not so clear. It's actually a question. Marar will ask it as a question. Says, why would we want to remember the pain of the and the suffering of the slavery and the exile on Pesach itself, which is the time when we're supposed to be in a state of Simcha. That's not our focus, that the, Mar, Mar is not our focus tonight. That would be, that would be we may, if we have time, maybe we'll have a, a class on that also. But the reality is the Mar actually is not a Torah mitzvah for us anymore because, or at least nowadays, because it's only a Torah mitzvah when it's eaten together with the Korban Pesach. In a certain sense, it's almost like the Mar is kind of like the mustard that you have with the meat um, when you're eating the carbon. Longer discussion. The bottom line is, since we don't have the Korban Pesach, we don't have the Mar as a Torah mitzvah, we do have it as a rabbinic mitzvah. The only mitzvah that we have, the only one of these assays, the eating mitzvahs of Pesach, that we still have as a Torah mitzvah on Pesach is the eating of the matzah. The matzah is very prominently dis- displayed before us as we're going through the whole seaport. We're covering it, we're opening it, we're taking it off the table, putting it on the table, right? It's very, it's both, it's, it's, set, it's, it's a centerpiece of the, of the, of, on the table, and it's central to the whole, as, as it's woven, its presence is woven into our telling over the whole seaport. It's clear that matzah has uh, a, a lot to do with what's going on at the Seder, and really in Gullahs, 
that 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 really is that that's really the centerpiece. In other words, when the when the base of Mikdash is there, then the Korban Pesach is the centerpiece. When we're in Golas, when the base of Mikdash is not there, then the Matz is the centerpiece. And that's worth thinking about in its own right. Why it would be that in a certain sense the focus of the holiday has shifted as a result of the context within which we're exper- which, which which we're experiencing that. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But basically, we need to understand what this matzah is really all about. That is our mitzvah, mais, that, that's the maisa mitzvah that, uh, that remains with us now as a Torah mitzvah. And basically, if you, if you, you, can't, you can't understand Pesach without understanding the matzah. Now, Pesach, obviously, I don't need to tell you, it's about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, which means that the focal, the, the, the dominant theme of Pesach is certainly going to be freedom. Right, and uh, we see that reflected in the tefillah, where we, when in the in the tefillah of the Chagim, we refer to Pesach as who knows, don't shout it all at once, keep on the mute, keep your voices down because you're all saying it simultaneously as you always do in class. Right, Zman Cheruseinu. Right, so Pesach is Zman Cheruseinu, but we also see that the Chumash itself will refer to Pesach as Chag Hamatzos. Now, since as we've spoken about so many times, names are crucial in the Torah. Names always identify the essence of something. So if we're going to call Pesach Chagamatzos, we never call it Chagamorer, right? If we're going to call it Chagamatzos, and it's, it is referred to that way in the Pesukim themselves. That means that Matzah must be part of the essential, it must be tied to the essence of Pesach, which we already know is freedom, which means that Matzah is something that has to be clearly associated with freedom. And in fact, in the tefillah, we put the two of them together. We talk about Chag HaMatzah's Hazeh Zman Cheruseinu. So if the Chag is a Chag of Matzah and it's a time of freedom, what that means is the Matzah's freedom. Halachically, we see that also, if there was any doubt whatsoever. Halachically, again, I mentioned this to you before, uh, we know that, that, at, that we're supposed to we're, when, we, when we're eating at the Seder, we're supposed to eat it in a manner which is reflective of the freedom that we're experiencing when we're eating those symbols of freedom. For example, when you eat mara, you sit bolt upright when you're eating that mara because that mara has nothing to do with freedom. But when you're eating that matzah, or at least the men, the oppressed minority of the Jewish people, the men of the Jewish people, they have to recline when they're eating the matzah. And if they don't recline when they eat the, in the matzah, they are oppressed to the point where they have to eat the matzah again. But reclining is, is, is indicative of freedom. We only recline when we're doing something which is relevant to the freedom. We are required to recline when we're eating the matzah. That's the men. The women are smart enough to realize you choke when you're doing that nowadays. It used to be the way that free men used to eat, but now we don't know how to do it anymore. So the, the, the wisdom of the women gets them to eat the matzah when they're sitting up. It's the men who get uncomfortable. The bottom line is halachically we see that the matzah is identified with the freedom of the holiday. Fine, that's great. The problem is that the matzah is cold. Slow down. Okay, I bet, then I guess I better get my watch out to see what time it is. Okay, anyway, yeah. The problem is that we know that the chumish calls matzah, go ahead, say it all at once, called lechem oni, right? In psukim, in, 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 let's see if I can, I'll switch to my, switch to my, one second, I can do it down here, right? Screen us, share my screen for just a second. There, we should see it over there, right? Lechem Oni, you can see it over here in Dvarim, right? Tochal of Matzos, Lechem Oni, yeah? Stop, share. There you go. There you go. Came back. Okay, it works. Okay, anyway, it's called Lechem Oni. Right, Rashi over there in Dvarim, when it's when it's called Lechem Oni, tells us it's supposed to recall to us the affliction that we experienced when we were in Mitzrayim. The Svarno says it's called Lechem Oni because that's what we ate in our Aeneas, in our affliction, in our slavery when we were in Mitzrayim. Right. Not only do we find that Matzah is referred to as Lechem Oni, but the Haggadah specifically highlights this aspect of the matzah, because at the beginning of the matzah, we hold up our seder plate, we hold up our matzah, and we talk, we describe it as, that's right, we call it ha-lachma anya, right? Not only that, we break the matzah at the beginning of the seder, we hide part of it away, but the gemar itself says one of the reasons why it's referred to as, referred to as lechem oni is just like a poor person can't afford to eat a whole loaf, 
so also the matzah, the the matzah, the, the mitz, the matzah that is the mitzvah of the matzah is specifically a broken piece in that seder where you have the whole pieces and the broken piece. The broken piece is the one that is the matzah because it's supposed to be lechem oni. So we see that not only is the lechem referred to as lechem oni, but we see that this oni aspect of this matzah is being highlighted and in the Haggadah, and it's being emphasized in the Haggadah, and yet we recline when we're eating it, and it is a symbol of freedom. How are we supposed to put those two things together? Right, on a certain level, the murr makes more sense. The murr is a symbol of the affliction, but the matzah is not. The matzah is a symbol of freedom, and yet it has some, some oni aspect to it, and we keep on emphasizing that oni aspect of it. Not only that, this the, the, the Aeneas really gets driven, driven very powerfully in the way that it's presented in our Haggadah. The Groh highlights this point. The Groh talks about the fact that the word Oni is used in four different contexts in Tanakh. Right? The word Oni is used to refer to somebody who's hungry. Right? V'yancha v'yarevecha, that's in Chumash. And in Tehillim, we, 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 we grouped Ani together with Evion, which means it's someone who is poor in the sense of needy, right? The word Ana Bederach Kochi, the word Oni in Tehillim is also identified with someone who is not home, it's away from the place where they belong, right? And then, and then we have it also used in the context of when Sarah was afflicting Hagar, that term is also used over there, so the idea of being afflicted by another person is also identified with this term oni. Oni has the if we we're going to on, on an essential level, these four dimensions of Aeneas represent the totality of affliction and poverty that is possible for a human being to experience. All four of them are used with this term oni. And if you're paying attention, hungry, needy, traveling and slavery, where do we see those four terms mentioned in the Haggadah? So think about it for a minute. You can unmute if you come up with it. So that's what we say in the Halach Ma'anya, called Dichvin. Anyone that's hungry, they should come and join us. Ditzrich, anyone who's needy, come and join us. Now we're here, there meaning in, in the context of the Gada, meaning in exile. In the year to come, we should be in Eretz Yisrael and Yerushalayim. We're traveling. And then we're also, now we're slaves, Avadim. We should be free men in the future. In the, in, in the Halach Man, let's see if we've got it on the sheet here. I think we do. Share screen one more time. Where's the Halach Man? I've got it in here someplace. There we go. Everybody see over here with the cursor? Halach Ma'anya. That's the thing that everybody's familiar with. That our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt called Dichvin. Anyone who's needy, come and eat with us. Called Ditzrich. Anyone who, uh, I was hungry rather. Dichvin is hungry. Anyone who's hungry, come and eat with us. Called Ditzrich. Anyone who's needy can come and partake of the Pesach. Hashasahacha. Right now. We are here. That's the one I should really be highlighting, right? Right? L'shana haba ba'ar di Yisrael. May it be that in the future we'll be near Yisrael. Hashata Abde, right? Abde, you can unmute for the Amen, right? Hashasa Abde, now we're slaves. In the coming year, may we be free men. Here we have those four instances that Aeneas is used, the four ways Aeneas is used in Tanakh, which represent the full gamut of Aeneas, they're all specifically referenced in relation to the Halach Ma'anya. This is the bread of, of, of poverty. Those who are hungry, come and join us. Those who are needy, partake of the Pesach. Now we're here. May we in the future be in Eretz Yisrael. Now we are slaves in the future. May we be B'nai Chori. So we see that the Haggadah does not really mention the fact that these Matzah is Lechem Oni, but it seems to really drive that point home as if it's essential 
to the whole nature of the matzah as it plays a role in the Seder, which again is very strange for us because this is the Zman Chayrusen of the time of our freedom. It's Chaga Matzos, which means the matzah represents the essence of what the Chag is about. It's a time of freedom. We recline when we're eating it. And then it's Halach Ma'anya with all this emphasis that's really being brought home by the text over there. What's going on? What is the story over here? Why isn't, um, why isn't, Hungry is subcategory of needy. Like, what's the difference? Hungry means that you don't even have your subsistence. It means that your survival is at stake. Needy is another level where that's not the issue, but you certainly don't have what you feel like you need to be in a state of 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 menuchas and nefesh. So the ani, the first ani, the one who's hungry, it means that he's really he's uh, that his his life is in danger as about as a result of his poverty. The second one means that you are like, you, you have a sense that you don't have what you need, but your survival is not at stake. Good question. Okay. Actually, the truth is, you can't trust me. There really is another, there is another aspect to Aeneas besides these four. And the place where you see it is in Parshas Vayechi, the last Parsha in Bereshis. Comes out over there in the following way. But if you look in the psukim, I'm sorry, I don't have, I don't have, a, I don't have a visual for you here. But in an actual safer Torah, as you make the transition from one parsha to another parsha, there's always a space of le- of empty and empty uh, empty letters, a space between the last pasuk of the previous parsha and the first pasuk of the new parsha. There's one exception to this rule, and that's parshas vayechi the last Parsha in Bereshis, where it goes, where one Pasek falls immediately after the other in a, as, 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 as they normally do. The Medrash asks the questions, why? Manish Tana Parsha is a Mikola Parshios. I'm not sure it asks it. It doesn't exact, ask exactly that way, but that's basically the question that it's asking. And it gives a very strange answer. What it says is, because in Parsha's Vayechi, Vayechi is recorded the death of Yaakov, it tells us the eyes and the hearts of the Jewish people were closed off by the shibud, the enslavement which they experienced in Mitzrayim. Now, there's something strange in that. Again, one more time. We're in Parshas Vayechi, we're at the end of Bereshis, right? And we're being told that the, the actual the term in Hebrew is it's the Parshas Satum, Satum, it's closed off. It doesn't have the space in between. Right, it, and and it asks the question why, and it says because we're recording the death of Yaakov, so therefore it, Satum closed off the eyes and hearts of the Jewish people were closed by the Sheba, by the enslavement, because Yaakov is 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 leaving the Jewish people at that time. Who can think of a question on that? Why does that sound strange to us? So you, if you, if you, you may remember back. The Chumash itself actually ends at the very, very end with the passing of Yosef. But when Yaakov dies, Yosef is 56 years old, which means he has another 54 years to live. No enslavement whatsoever began with the passing of Yaakov. There's an aspect that was there before his passing, meaning they were already they were already in a land that was not their own. They were Gerim, they were foreigners. But that started long before the death of Yaakov, and there was no 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 change in their status with the death of Yaakov. We don't have any shibud whatsoever, really, until the end of any of the shvatim, even after the time of the passing of Yosef. So how can it be that the Medrash tells us? that this Parsha is Satum, it's closed off because with the passing of Yaakov, the eyes and the hearts of the Jewish people become closed off by the Shibut. What's going on over here? What is it talking about? So when you see a situation like this, you have to ask, okay, so it must be that they may not have been enslaved, but something has to have changed as the result of Yaakov's passing. So what would be the specific significance of the passing of Yaakov? 
The answer is, what came to an end with the passing of Yaakov? Don't all shout it out at once, right? Basically, Yaakov was the last of the, of the Avot, of the Avos. The passing of Yaakov is the end of the era of the Avos. And what the, what the Medrash is really telling us, something is changing as a result of the fact that we no longer have the Avot around. And what's changing is basically the Avot personify clarity, especially Yaakov. Yaakov, who is Emet, right? That is his, that's what he's known for, for his clarity. But the Avot in general were, had sufficient clarity of the nature of the world they were living in. They were able to intuit the mitzvot looking at the physical world in front of them. Everything about the Avos was uh, an idea of clarity and understanding. And basically what you have with the passing of the Avos is the passing of that clarity, which is emphasized by the other answer, which Rashi brings down also from the measures to explain why Parshas Vayichi is satum, it's closed off. Because what happened when Yaakov wanted to tell his children what the future was going to be for them, to reveal for them the whole future until the coming of the Mashiach, his, it was chatzatum, it was cut off from him. He was not allowed to give over that information to his children, meaning that the clarity which characterized the avot in general was something that he wanted to give over to his children, and he was stopped from doing that. There's actually a very interesting medrash tanchuma that says, it gives a metaphor, a mushal for understanding this. And the mushal that it gives is, it's like a, a, a loyal slave of a king who is on his deathbed, and as he's about to pass, pass on, he gathers his children around them, and he's about to reveal to them where they can find the documents that give them freedom from service to the king are hidden, where they can go and get them. He's about to tell them where it is, and then he suddenly notices the king is standing on top, just over, above him, and listening to everything he's saying. Instead of telling them where the document is to become free, he says, you should be loyal servants of the king, just like I was a loyal servant of the king. That metaphor is given by the Medrash, the Medrash San to say that would be the equivalent of what would, what would be the equivalent of Yaakov revealing the future to his children, giving them this knowledge and clarity, it would be as if they were given documents of freedom from the service of the king, from the service of the Kaddish Baruch Meaning, what it's basically saying over here is the era of the Avot, the era of knowledge, had come to an end, and what happened, what was coming now is in order to serve a Kaddish Baruch Hu, we needed to serve in a context where we did not have that clarity. Some of the fortune explained is that they were, we're transferring from a time of emet to emuna, that, uh, that the avot were able, that their service was in a context of clarity. Our service has to be specifically in a context where we don't have that clarity in order for it to be service. The question is why? I think the answer to that is what the, something that the Gro explains, which is the essence of all aniut, of all affliction, is none of these four that we spoke about before. They're the physical expression of them, but the essence of aniut is ani bedat, someone who does not have understanding, someone who doesn't have clarity. And what's really speaking about over there is what really makes the pain of galut, galut, what really makes exile, exile, is the fact that we don't understand what's going on or where it's going. Pain in and of itself is not really painful in the sense that we're willing to enter into circumstances where we experience pain if it has a specific purpose, if we're getting something from it, right? Think of an athlete who's training for a marathon, right? It's not fun to be doing those, all those exercises, but if you feel like it's getting you somewhere, you do it voluntarily because you want what's going to come as a result of it. When you see clearly what the purpose is behind any affliction you're experiencing, it's not really affliction, it's process. But the reality is the time had come for us to experience galut. The time had experience had come for us to experience exile. We don't know why yet, we'll get there in a minute, right? But, but were the Jews to have known, were Yaakov been, had Yaakov been able to give over to his children exactly what was gonna happen to them, and as they would go through each and every detail of the experience of the galut, they would know what his purpose was. It wouldn't really be galut. It would be process, right? It's clo it was closed off from him in order that they would, that they would experience the galut as a galut. Ani bedat. But the base, the base is, uh, the, 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 if you want sort of a, a uh, if you're looking for like a geometric sort of picture for yourself, 
these four, the idea of having four different aspects of galut represent the four directions of a flat physical plane. When you're pulling something away from the center, you pull it, it goes in four different directions. If you're connected to that center place that, connect, that really has you centered to get something above you, then those things can't pull you away because you're connected to something in the middle. It's when you're missing that sense of connection that when something pulls at you, you're pulled away from your center and you lose your center, something which is so definitive of the nature of the experience of Galut. The bottom line is when we list out these four, the, 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 really the, 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 the fourness of the different, of Dichvin, of Ditzrich, of, of Hashata and Avde, these different forms of Anit that are being described over here, what they're really talking about is they're, they're, they're talking about the fact that, you, that, that these dalid represent the flatness of a plane that's missing that depth, that fifth, that fifth dimension of a connection to a center. We've probably spoken about it sometime during the course that we spoke about the whole nature of a hay. A hay is a dalid with the yud in the middle or a vav in the middle, either one depending. And the idea of a hay is the hay, we talked about the fact that Olam Haza was created with a hay. A hay represents a reality that has meaning with it. The dalid is the, the Dalit represents that flat physical plane which has no depth to it. When you put the Yud in there, what it means is that fifth dimension that arises that, that gives depth to things. When there's depth, what? If the Yud is the future tense, meaning the, uh, the conceptual idea, if I understand what's going on, it's not what's actual, what's what my understanding of things, but when the Dalit represents, the Dalit is, is, is Dal, meaning impoverished. It represents an empty physical reality. Dal, it's poor, and it represents the two, those of you who are into geometry, the two dimensions of a flat coordinate plane, meaning it's a reality without depth to it. The fifth, that what makes it a hay, gives it that depth, that connection to a place of meaning, right? When you're missing, them, when you're missing that meaning, that's when all you have left is that dalit, these four things that are pulling you away from any sense of purpose in your life, which is really the defining characteristic of exile. What's really coming out from this is the matzah, by being flat, is actually, in its very appearance, conveys this idea of Tao, of Aeneas, of this impoverishment, of this affliction, and just emphasize even more, like, what's going on here, right? We're, we're just hitting it over and over and over again. Matzah's lechem oni, it represents Aeneas, it represents the sense of affliction, a lack of das, if you want to put it that way. Like, we're entering, we were in a situation where we didn't know what was happening and why it was happening, that abandonment, which is the true pain of the experience of Golas. Why is the matzah, the bread, why is the matzah symbolic of Pesach, Chag Cherusein, at the time of our freedom? So the answer is that the Gra says, just as we see these four facets or forms of affliction in Aeneas, we have matching them four different instances where a person brings a carbon toga, right? The carbon toga is when a person goes through a difficult situation, which a Kodesh gets them out of, right? When you come out from one of these difficult situations, what it leads you to is an opportunity and appreciation for what it is that you have in your relationship with a Kodesh Baruch right? What are these four situations that you bring a carbon toga? They actually match up very nicely. A person who was, where's my list here? Oh, yeah, fine. A person who's sick, right? If you come out of an illness, right? Very timely to what we, our situation today. A person comes through illness, right? That's equivalent to being hungry, meaning of a physical lack. A person who passes through a difficult illness, they brought a Corbin Toda. A person who is going, traveled across the sea. When a person's a sailor in a boat, there's always the sense that the environment you're in is not, it's not, it doesn't have what you need. It's not secure, right? You long to return to the land. That what a person who's traveling across the sea is like, is a person who's traveling. A person who crosses a desert, which means you're going through a dangerous environment, right? That's like someone who's, uh, that's, that's the equivalent of, actually, the, the, the one across the sea is the equivalent of someone who has a sense of neediness, the, the land that, that I can't get what I need there. Person who's in, in a desert is a hostile environment, that's a traveler, and a person comes out of prison, right? When I was in a situation where I was afflicted by a bardas, by another person, when I get out of that situation, those are, that's the equivalent of slavery, 
these four aneos, uh, forms of, of affliction that the Gro points out, they match up precisely with these four forms of the carbon toda. And what basically the Gro is trying to tell us by this is that it's as a consequence of going through an experience of affliction that I have the capability of appreciating and connecting myself to a Kaddish Baruch Hu on a whole nother level. For those of you who are taking the Chumash class, we spoke about this, we were trying to explain what the whole purpose and nature of, of Golis is. The way we described it, and again, there's a longer discussion, but maybe we'll use it for another time, but we described it as Golis is like a, a rubber band, meaning the Jewish people at their very essence are connected to Kaddish Baruch Hu. we're defined around that relationship. When we come into a situation where they gets where we're pulled away from that connection, where we are no longer able to appreciate it or be aware of it or actualize that relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, it begins to slowly build up within us a hunger to recover that. It can be subconscious or it can be conscious, depends on the situation. But whether it's conscious or it's subconscious, when you come into a situation where that distance is suddenly, that which pulls away from the Kaddish Baruch Hu is removed, and we release all that energy, we go rushing back to Kaddish Baruch Hu and, and grasp onto him with a, a sense of almost desperation as we become aware of just how vulnerable we are, not just vulnerable, but how empty we are without that relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's like pulling like a rubber band that has two ends to it. So the distance between those two ends is the, is the length of that rubber band. If you want to get them any closer, what you do is you stretch the rubber band away, and when you release it, then the two ends of the rubber snap, snap together, and you're able to come to a level of closeness between those two ends that didn't exist, that, that wasn't possible to you before. Gullus in general is a process by which we lose that which really defines us on the most essential level. At some point, we come to be aware that we've lost ourselves. And when that which is pulling us away is removed, we go rushing back to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and what happens as a result is that we find ourselves closer to a Kaddish Baruch Hu than we were before. In terms of the goals of Mitzrayim, it's that very experience that allowed us to not only to go into Mitzrayim and come out, but on the journey out, we go, we go flying past the level of relation we had before we entered into Egypt, all the way to Sinai and Kabbalah Satara. The closeness of a Kabbalah Satara, when a kind of was able to say to us, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, with the closeness that that, re that, that represented, that we were able, the ability to get there was a consequence of having passed through the Golas and then been able to return to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, which ultimately brought us to a place where we were closer to him than we were when we started. When we look at the matzah, right, the whole idea of the matzah is, right, we talked about the fact that what symbolizes the aneas, the poverty of the matzah, not only is its flatness, but the fact that we broke that matzah, it's incomplete. We're specifically supposed to hold on to this smaller broken piece, to be the matzah that we're using at the Seder, but how does the Seder end? What did we do with that big piece that we broke off from our matzah? We use that as the zecher to the Korban Pesach. That represents that piece that's missing is the connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu that it actually comes to the Korban Pesach. And where do we get to at the end of the Seder? At the end of the Seder, we pull that piece that's the Afi Komen that comes at the very, very end, right? We eat the, the, the matzah at the meal, and at the end of the meal, we bring out that Afi Komen, which was that larger piece that was missing, which really represents recovering the connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. We're still left with the question, what changed? Matzah throughout the Seder was representing the broken piece, the smaller piece, the poverty, the ignorance, the lack of understanding and appreciation. How come suddenly it's the whole matzah, we're connected back to Kaddish Baruch Hu? Because what were we missing? We're missing understanding. We're missing das. The whole point of the Seder and the Sipur is a process by which we come to understand what was happening to us, why it was happening to us, where it was leading us, ultimately where it was leading us to was to that connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Interestingly enough, right, the Seder actually begins, we get an indication at the very beginning of the Seder, beginning of the Seder, we're told that the, uh, that the, the, the Tanoim were all sitting in B'nai Brak with Rabbi Akiva telling over the story of Mitzrayim all night long. When did they stop telling the story? When the Talmudim came in and said, it's time for, who remembers? Kriyat Shema Shel Shachris, right? Wait, when it's time to say Kriyat Shema, when it's time to say Shema, when it's time to recognize 
the Malkabolat Kabbalat or Malkut Shamay. It's time to recognize the Malchus and recover the, uh, the relationship of Malchus with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? That you tell the seaboard until you come there. Just like you eat the meal until you come to the Avikomen, that piece of the matzah which really represents the Korban Pesach. So as we're, as we're sitting at the Seder, we want to have our eyes on that matzah, right? That matzah is a double role for us. On one level, it's the, it's the lechem oni, right? That represents really all the afflictions that we experience in the time. But on the other level, it represents the potential for closeness to a Kaddish Baruch Hu that came as a result of having experienced that affliction. In fact, the Sfarno, when he explains that term lechem oni in Dvarim, he says, why do we call it, why, why are we re- referring to Lechem Oni? Because the, and the, the depth of the Aeneas, of the affliction that we felt there is represented in just, when, when an Egyptian would come around and say, get up and go work, we have to run to do that work, right? The, the, the extent of the control of the Egyptians over us was a measure of how deeply in exile we were, how afflicted and far away from Akash Bark we were, we were running, Whenever the whenever they when they were told us says the Svarno, the speed with which we had to run when the Egyptians commanded us to work was inversely proportional with the speed with which we left Mitzrayim when the time to leave came, right? Mm-hmm. And the the idea over there is what was what was the, what was the engine that was that was taking us out of Egypt it was the fact that we were connected to Kadesh Baruch when serving Kadesh Baruch to that extent no one could hold us back, right? The the Maral, when he talks about Masa he talks about something which is bread without time because what the the the, the matzah represents the speed the alacrity the zrizut with which we left mitzrayim and the speed of that 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 we left was that the mitzrayim as powerful they, as they were were completely incapable of retarding our departure as long as the country part was the one that was leading us out and he led us out to the extent that we were connected to him the point is the that we break this matzah the matzah has to be break quickly it's bread without time on one level, it's lechem and oni, the poverty of the affliction of being in Mitzrayim where we had to jump and run wherever the Egyptians commanded us. On the other hand, it's the speed with which we left the bread of freedom, the speed with which we left Egypt, the speed with which we left is inversely proportional with, these, with, with the depth of our servitude to the Egyptians. And again, the matzah is, it, it, it visually represents to us both the affliction that we experienced there and also the freedom that we gained as a result of having gone through that affliction. When we're at the Seder, we want to keep your eyes up. We're going through that seaport, right? As much as you're hungry and waiting for the meal to come along, right? Your eye is on that matzah whenever you're talking, when you're talking about the story, because if you can absorb the meaning of that matzah, then you can absorb what the, in other words, the matzah in a certain sense is, gives us a visual and physical representation of everything that we're trying to achieve through telling over that seat board, which is coming to the point where we enter one, when we rededicate ourselves to that relationship with the Kaddish Baruch of Malchus, which was created through the, uh, the experience in Mitzrayim. Okay, any questions? You want to unmute yourselves? Or we can just schmooze for a, little, for a couple of minutes until Rabbi Manny. Rabbi Manny is going to be answering any questions, you halachic questions you have on the... Uh, on Pesach, or you, I guess if you have any others, he's also there to answer them. Any questions, or how are we? Okay, you're good. Okay, Ms. Kagan has a question. Uh oh, now now Rabbi Kagan is worried. Everybody hear the question? Ms. Kagan asked the question. You have to remember the year. year, year, year. So the, this question, Ms. Kagan asked the question, do, does our present circumstances, and I think what she, what she means by that is that we have the warm weather, right? right? Do our present circumstances alter our appreciation or understanding of what the Seder is really all about? Especially the matzah. Especially the matzah. So... I mean, we had, I actually, we had a, uh, we had an alumni gathering on Sunday to talk about both the connection to Pesach and sort of the, 
the matzah that's going on in the world. And what we, one of the things that we spoke about there was that we live in a world where we really crave control. And the, the society that we live in is really, is built very much around mastering the physical world in order to sort of control our lives and our environment. And that's, that is, to a certain extent, that really defines, the, that's an aspect, a defining aspect of the Gullus as we live in it now, which is, we, we, we're not, we, we don't want to trust in a Kaddish Baruch Hu. We want to feel like, we, in other words, we, we, our relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu is we get what we need essentially through our tefillah. We need to act also, but we recognize that tefillah is really going to be the means which ch- de- determines the success of our actions or not. That's how we're supposed to relate to reality. We live in a world that trains us to trust in our own actions to be getting us what it is that we need. This very much characterizes the nature of the Golas as we experience it now. And being able to recognize the fact that our own vulnerabilities accept those vulnerabilities and embrace those vulnerabilities. And the other way, but I'll put it to you another way, that um, in the time of the Miraglim, one of the things that upset the Miraglim and why they wouldn't go into Eretz Yisrael is the Miraglim told them that there are no rivers in Eretz Yisrael. You're dependent on the rain. In Egypt, we had water whenever we wanted it. We got it from the Nile. But in Israel, it's not like that. You know, it's dependent on the rain. And rain is dependent upon tefillah, meaning you have to recognize and accept your dependence upon a Kaddish Baruch Hu, the relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. The world as we live in is only the medium for that relationship. That's really what Eretz is all about. And that's what, is, is it what it is to be a Jew. Wanting a situation where you're in control and you don't have to rely on it, that actually is the gullus, because that really blocks you from really appreciating the nature of our relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. So to a certain extent, this, the, the, the matzah that we're in right now, it's one of the things that's very interesting about it. The matzah, the matzah that we're in now, the matzah that we're in right now, one of the really interesting things is exactly this point, which is that, you know, it's like, and like, and it's like, it's, there's a Gemara that talks about the, the it's the, the, it's this, you like, we don't have any control. We can't, look how difficult it is to control this thing and talk about like how insignificant the thing that's threatening us. It's like a, an RNA molecule. I mean, give me a break. When the Gemara talks in the same language, when Titus, who destroyed Bayashani, challenged the Kaddish Baruch Hu to, to, to battle with him on the land where he could fight back, Kaddish Baruch Hu says, okay, I'll do it. But you know what I'm going to, I'm going to fight, you know what I'm going to fight you with? I'm going to fight you with a mosquito. I'm going to send a mosquito up. He sent a mosquito up through his nostril that went into his brain and said, "Whatever." It's a, it wasn't. It wasn't pleasant for Titus. But the point is, he fought him with a, with a with a mosquito. You want to challenge me? You think that you have power? You think you have control? I can I can destroy you with a mosquito. So we live in a world which is very very much built around increasing constantly the extent to which we control our circumstances. And to have the whole thing literally thrown on its head by a molecule is just, it's just a, st- it's a staggering thing to watch. It's like, uh, it's like, uh, as my brother put it, like living in a science fiction movie. It's like, uh, it's like, it's, but it's, it, I think what, 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 what it does make us aware of is that Kaddish Baruch gives us the gift of being able to have a certain amount of control over our circumstances, but that's a facade over the fact that ultimately we really, really are dependent upon him. It's a message that really comes up a lot in the, it was very much a theme in Purim also. But the, I think that, I think if you understand that the Mats is there really to make us aware of just how much, it's how much we need and want a connection to Kaddish Baruch I think the situation we're in makes that really clear, really makes, but it's important to emphasize another point. It's not just that we're vulnerable to circumstances without a Kaddish Baruch Hu. it's that without that connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu, we've lost a piece of ourselves, right? The depth of our experience of our humanity, the fullness of our experience of humanity has to do with engaging and developing that cell melakim, that inner self, which has to do with that connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's not that we're threatened if we, if we don't have the connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's an aspect also, but that's not the essential aspect. The essential aspect is if I don't have the connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu, I've really lost myself. And the, that, 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 that's what you want to have as one of the, primary so when you're looking at my saying your dependency it doesn't just the oppression is really an external version the oppression is really an external version of sort of an inner kind of emptiness 
that we're really looking to be full human beings, which means to engage that cell and came to live life in a deep and meaningful way. The only way to do that is through that connection to the Jabarfu. Questions? 